question. All right. Um, you got these big concerts, and you know, and Elvis is getting ready. What does he do before he goes on stage to prep himself? Well, he uh, usually gets to the show very short. Now he comes to intermission when we're on the road, and he comes down a little bit earlier when we're in the because he can hang out in the dressing room when we're in Vegas. But we developed. He was so nervous when he would go on that we developed, he and I started in 69 in Vegas, we started doing this Indian wrestle stretch thing where he would pull me towards him and I would pull him with our feet side by side like this here, like Indian wrestling. Then we'd switch and do that and he would shake his hands like he was trying to get rid of the energy and everything and he would no, 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 and he would do his voice real low, make some, no, no, no and make sure that he was ready. And that basically it. And he was nervous. Boy, when he hit that stage, <laughs> bang, it was gone. He was dynamite then. But he did nervous there. OK. Wait. I know you weren't working for him at this time, but do you think he would have ever actually married Ginger? No. No, and it's nothing against Ginger when I say that. I know a lot of fans don't like her. And for obvious reasons, they think she's partly responsible, but we know that Elvis is responsible when it comes down to it. It's just hard to accept that and say it. But I don't think that he would have. I just don't think Elvis would ever have gotten married again to anybody. I felt that if he would have, he probably would have married Linda Thompson after a couple of three years because she took such great care of him, great personality. And uh, they had a really, really good thing. But Elvis should never really, and this is not a slam on Priscilla, should never have even gotten married in the first place. He didn't belong to one woman. He couldn't belong to one woman. He belonged to the women of the world. They loved him. That's why all of them, you hear him say, oh, I felt like he was singing just to me. Well, he was, to you and to you, <laughs> but he communicated. He was a great communicator, and he made people, women especially, feel very good when he yes, would sing. He did. Yeah. Thank you. Sonny, what was the blue police light that Elvis had in his studs or in a car that he took, like, to the Memphian or whatever? What was the idea behind that? <laughs> he was a policeman. Thank you. <laughs> no, he got, uh, he got a badge, uh, chief deputy badge. He got me a lieutenant badge. He got red a lieutenant badge on the Shelby County Sheriff's Department. We went through training. Red and I went through firearm training and everything like that. But he got this, red, this blue light that fit on the dash, or you've seen it, it used to be a red light on Kojak that they can stick up with a magnet on top of the roof in an unmarked car. But he would put it up on the dash, and he would use that mainly when he wouldn't use it to get somewhere. But we'd be driving to the movie, and some car would speed by. He'd put that blue light on and catch up and pull him over. <laughs> and we weren't sure who was in that car that was speeding or why, so we had to go up there to him. i got to tell you. I was a little nervous going up to these cars. We didn't know a drug dealer. We didn't know what, a guy just robbed a bank and trying to get away. So we said, Elvis, you don't need to do this. But he said, oh, no, man, this speed caused a wreck. I said, yeah, but what if they got a gun? He said, we got guns. We'll kill them. <laughs> OK, so one night, though, it was real funny. This guy come by us, and we are cruising along. And Elvis is driving, and he's doing about the speed limit maybe even a little bit more, and this car goes by us doing about just five or six miles over the speed limit, but he did pass us. I was, uh-oh, no. hit that blue light. That car pulls over and starts pulling over the side of the road, and we get, Elvis, man, he wasn't really speeding. God, you're not even doing the speed limit, you know? Yeah, he, he wasn't so bad, and he unplugged, and we kept going. That guy's sitting there wondering what's going on, you know? Police light, not, and it's a Lincoln. It's not a police car, so that was kind of surprising to him, yeah. But that's mainly what it was, just the same thing he had a badge for. He wanted to be a cop. I think Elvis, if he hadn't been a singer, probably would have been a FBI, CIA, or, or a cop or something. You know, he's very pro-police. Okay. Sonny, I know you worked uh, security for a lot of years there. Did you ever have any close calls, close calls or uh, security breaches that was Close. Yeah, we had, we did. That's a good question. We had uh, the main, the the main problem with the security was people accidentally hurting him. Women reaching for him, wanting a lock of his hair, or reaching for his ring, or reaching up to touch him and scratching him without meaning to. This is what we really had to watch out for. But we had some really uh, serious threats to to kill him. We had bomb threats at some of the buildings we played. But uh, 
The worst one was when we had one from someone out there in Vegas with uh, someone going to kill Elvis for $50,000. They, they would tell who it was. They knew who it was. And so the FBI was called in. And this was in 1970. And we'd, been, we'd done two or three engagements and nothing had happened there. But this one, the FBI said, they did a profile, said he doesn't care if he's caught. He wants to get caught. He's not going to shoot from the balcony. He's going to come right down front or he's going to be seating down front. And he's going to just stand up and shoot. So after he explained this to us, Elvis took Red and myself and Jerry aside. And tears came to his eyes. He said, man, you guys know I have never done anything to anybody for someone to kill me. He says, I want your word that if it happens, you guys get to him first before anybody else. He said, I want his eyeballs ripped out. I want him so torn up. I do not want a smirk on his face in some courtroom like Charles Manson that his claim to fame was he killed Elvis Presley. You guys got to promise me. We promised him, and by golly, we would have. We would have got there. But it didn't, nothing happen from him. And then the, the thing ended. He wasn't even supposed to have to go on. But the hotel told him, you know, he said, no, these people come, some of them come to town, some of them's going to be leaving. They came here, they want to see me, they're going to see a show. Oh, he did it. Thank you. But that's the worst serious one we had. But we, we had other ones where <laughs> one woman said she's going to kill him because he rejected her. <laughs> yeah. Did you enjoy working in Stay Away, Joe? And do you recall any bloopers, anything that happened on the set? <laughs> bloopers every, every movie, many of them. And Elvis handled them really great. Yeah, I loved working on, on that. I played a, a guy named Jackson Heathrow. I had a good part on it, like a featured role. I played an Indian that grew up with him. Uh, he was half Indian, and we grew up together on the reservation. And there was a scene in there when he comes back from rodeos, and he's got the Congress, he's conned them into letting them bring some cattle, and the Indians start making some money by raising cattle and selling them and everything. He's got the, he comes riding in on that bull that's going to give him all these baby cows. Well, after we did that, he started, we started a little kind of a free-for-all fighting and, and fun. And we work our way down, and he knocks me over a log, and I go over backwards, and he, someone grabs him and tackles him and takes him down into the dirt. And I get up and come around, so I end up down there, and there's this water there. It's supposed to be a creek, but they just dammed it off and, and put some water in there, like there was a river you know, running through there little creek and I'm supposed to go at him and throw a punch and he takes me and does a throw and throws me into the water I'm the first one to go in well he slipped a little bit and there were some rocks there and my head and when we saw it came that close to hitting that rock before I went in the water I didn't realize it because the rock was behind me I didn't know it but when we saw it Elvis saw it when he was throwing me, it scared him. But he knew when I jumped up out of the water, I was okay and everything, that I didn't hit it. But we had a lot of fun. We did that. I did a lot of fight scenes with Elvis. I doubled other actors. Red did it also. We uh, fought with Elvis a lot. They even got where they cast actors that were big like us so that we would look like them. But they're, they're... Sonny, uh, did the Colonel influence Elvis so much that uh, change things he really wanted to do? I mean, he couldn't do what he really wanted to do because of the colonel, the way he set things up? But yeah, uh, th those things happened, but it wasn't because of an influence or anything like that where a colonel was putting his will out on him. Uh, colonel's strong personality, but he's a strong businessman. And what he did was he signed Elvis to multiple picture deals. Everyone wanted to have that security. Elvis came back from Germany after leaving and not performing and doing anything for two years with the words ringing in his ears of all his critics saying, oh, he's a flash in the pan, he won't last, he'll be gone, this and that. Well, he kind of thought maybe in the Army while he was there in that two years that that just might happen, that he might be a flash in the pan and the fans not be there. Well, when he came back, the Colonel started getting these multiple movie contracts signed. All of a sudden, Elvis knew, hey, they believe in me still. So he felt good about it. But Colonel make a bad decision with all that he had to make. I'm going to tell you something. I'll tell you this, and I mean it from the bottom of my heart. Colonel Parker, if I could go to my grave 
and make half of the right decisions that he made regarding Elvis, I would be very happy that I had really, really accomplished more than I ever thought I could. And along with that, I would take all of the bad decisions he's made, and I'd take all of them, and I'd still be way out balanced. But he, he was, uh, he, his, Elvis was his best interest. And there's been things that have come out against him, make not, Elvis not doing the Star is Born, because he told Strice and he wanted to do it. But after two or three days, Elvis realized what a challenge that was. He had to lose weight. He had to quit taking things that he was taking. He'd have to do it for months at a time while they filmed. It got to be too big a challenge for him. He told the Colonel, get him out of it. So Colonel put the price up too high. Colonel said Elvis was to get top billing. Now, you're not going to get that in Streisand, especially if she's the producer. She's not going to let anyone have billing over her. So she said these things about the Colonel, put too much, asked for too much. Well, Elvis didn't want to do it. Colonel took the heat, never made an excuse, never defended it. And there was a story similar to that with uh, Judy Garland and Elvis. They came to the Colonel in the 60s. They wanted Judy Garland and Elvis to do a children's album together. And the uh, Colonel came to Elvis, you want to do it? They're offering $25,000. I said, no, I don't really want to, Colonel. He said, okay. So he went back and he told the people, he said, you know, Elvis, we'd have to have $100,000 for Elvis to take the time to do that. And they said, we don't have that in our budget. Judy's going to do it for twenty five. He said, well, I'm just telling you that we have to have that for Elvis for the time it'll take. And they said, well, we don't have that. Well, they left. They came back about a week later and said, Colonel, we got the money. <laughs> <laughs> Colonel, fast on his feet. Oh, well, no, when you left here, you, you said you couldn't do it. So he said, I've already booked that time. He's not available for about four years now. <laughs> that's how he got out of that situation. <laughs> but that's, that backs up the thing about Elvis didn't want to do it. Colonel didn't stop it. Elvis didn't want to do it. And the multiple picture contracts kept Elvis from doing other movies that they'd come. They offered, they want him to do the part of Tony in West Side Story. They want him to do uh, Splendor in the Grass. Elia Kazan with, with Natalie Wood, who dated Elvis, told him about it. He saw King Creole. He said, whoa, he can, he can act. So he wanted him. Elvis was booked up on already, signed up to a movie. He was making three a year. He had no time open. So that's when Warren Beatty got it and it made him a superstar. So uh, these were things that just happened, but they weren't intentionally done, like Colonel Parker being the bad guy, you know, because he wasn't. He cared about Elvis, and he did the best he could, and I think he did a hell of a job. I worked with him a lot on the tour, so I was with him constantly on tour out there, and I saw what he did for Elvis. Good question, yeah. Sonny, lots of nice stories today and events that took place over 17 years. I'm curious. Is there something that stands out maybe more than others? I know there were special events along the way, but anything in particular that if you reflect back, maybe on a one-on-one -on -one basis with you and Elvis? Yeah. Uh, I would say, Tim, that probably what really sticks out in my mind, if you kind of took everything together about Elvis with his humility and his warmth and his compassion and his concern, and you take all of this, and you could probably wrap it up in one word. His humanity. His humanity was something like, you just don't, you know, it's such a big word, but it, he covered that word very well. It really brings him to it, you know. Yeah, humanity. Thank you. Mm -hmm.